And I think we are ready to start. I, 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 have, I don't have patience. I know people are joining, but we are starting. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, David levy Four, and I'm uh, the host here uh, in this seminar, uh, which goes both ways, both to the Israeli academia, uh, PhD students, as well as uh, to my colleague on, on regulation and political science uh, worldwide. There are a few of, the, of, of you from uh, many communities, and I welcome, welcome you all uh, here. Today, topics is ethic, ethic and research integrity in academic research. This is something that we should uh, speak about it, talk about it, um, um, think about it, and write about it, even if we are engineers or political scientists. I, I, I would say for political science, it's quite natural because we are interested in governance and integrity has to be regulated, governed. It's, it's, it, we, we can do integrity policies. We should do, probably should do, do more of that. But here is with me, uh, Professor Mark uh, Edwards, uh, a person, a, a researcher that I met uh, as, a, as a colleague who is interested in similar re regulatory issues, despite the fact that Mark is coming as a is professor for engineering. And Mark um, is a university distinguished professor of civil engineering at Virginia Tech. He teach environmental engineering, applied acoustic, uh, aquatic chemistry, engineering, but also engineering ethics. And we'll, we'll come into this engineering ethics uh, later on. Is a pioneered research into health, problem, health problems associated with uh, plumbing, plumbing systems including lead, copper, legionella, and pipe leaks uh, associated with mold. He has an um, excellent research group, group uh, that conducted and conducted investigative science and uh, uncovering the regulatory failures in Washington DC in the beginning of the, two, of the 2000s and then uh, in the famous, uh, infamous, I would say, Flint water disaster. This is where I'm coming uh, in with him, where, where I met him in this context, uh, studying the Flint water disaster. There are movies about that. There are, uh, of course, uh, uh, a lot of reading and news articles, YouTube, YouTube videos. I invite you to, 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 to see them. Now, with all that is also, uh, I guess, one of the more, probably the most uh, distinguished uh, awarded uh, academics that I met or hosted here. So here is the list. Time magazine uh, in 2004 listing, listed him as the among the first most important innovators in water around the world. The White House gave him the Presidential Faculty Fellowship in 1996. He got the MacArthur Fellowship in 2007. And in 2013, he was the ninth Ninth uh, uh, recipient of the Barros Award for courageously defending public interest at great personal risk. In 2016, it was uh, named among Time Magazine 100 most influential people of the world. Uh, it was uh, among the first, uh, the world 50 greatest leader of Fortune Magazine. And on and on it goes. I, I, you know, it's all, it's all on the invitation. Uh, but I will mention only one award. In two, in two thousand nineteen, he got the Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award. And one more award is the two thousand seventeen MIT Disobedience Award. Uh, did you know that there is a such a word, I didn't until I read that, but uh, I find the idea uh, fascinating. Maybe we have to, to, to have it also here in Israel, a disobedience award for academics or public servants. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining us. And um, maybe you want to say a few words before you start with the presentations, you know, about yourself, about your motives, and then go uh, That's actually part of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So please go on. So I'm not, let me see. 
Yeah. So, amount yeah, just, thank just increase it. The the excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank thank you, David, for that introduction. And I kind of heard what you wanted to, me to speak about, and I thought I'd reflect a little bit on my career of cowardice and conformity in a climate of perverse incentives. And I think like most of you, I grew up worshiping at the altar of science. And at a very young age, I, I had certain ideas about what it meant to be a scientist. And at age 13, I actually wrote down some of those principles and called them my seven commandments of science. And it's, it's kind of funny to look back at them now and that these are all from Richard Feynman. And you know, what came clear at that time uh, from Feynman was that science was a field of humility. It was a field of truth seeking and truth speaking. It was a it was a tribe that put its loyalty to the truth above everything else. And so Feynman talked about not fooling yourself and how that's difficult because your brain's always trying to fool you and be smart enough to know you're dumb and your goal should always be to prove yourself wrong as quickly as possible and uh, don't try to fool lay people. And he also had some comments on government that no government has uh, the right to decide the truth of scientific principles. So, you know, I present this nowadays and other scientists just laugh at me because they think it has nothing to do with modern science. And that's kind of a point of this presentation here. I think when Feynman wrote this, it was a time of sort of peak wisdom. Uh, it was after World War II when people had seen the horrors of politicized science. And, you know, I don't need to remind you, of course, uh, World War II was kind of built on, on horrific politicized science. Um, Nazi Germany, of course, had extremist eugenics ideas and social justice views and infamously said that the Nazi party is built on nothing but applied biology. And at the same time, on the same continent, at the other political extreme, we had Stalinist science, uh, which is scientific socialism. And if you read about the perversity of that science, how genetics was banned and biologists were shot and applying ridiculous scientific ideas actually resulted in, you know, massive famines and starvation. Um, so, you know, the message I got from, from this history and from Feynman is that politicized science is, is very, very dangerous and we never ever want to go back there again. And of course, humans are great at saying, you know, never again, but the reality is we, we don't learn. No, the only thing we learn from history is we never learn from history, right? So, uh, you know, I had a great career uh, as a biophysicist, as an undergrad. Uh, I enjoyed it. I became an environmental engineer, and then I, I joined the real world. And my first job was as a consultant. And I was very excited about applying my knowledge to help humankind. And lo and behold, my, my first job had to do with drinking water. And this is actually the water that was coming out of the tap. And we were working for the government-owned water utility, and our water was corrosive. Our water was eating their pipes up. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, um, we're going to be able to roll up our sleeves, apply science to stop this problem that was caused by our water. And this was in 1990. And unfortunately, the lawyers told us that, no, we were not going to do that. Uh, we were not going to do our jobs, that it was our position that this was the customer's problem. And so we fought uh, that. I felt very uh, bad about this. I felt the government agency was bet betraying the public trust. We were. Uh, we got sued uh, for over th $30 million, and we deserved it. And so one of my first lessons was that if you ever want to get sued and deserve to be sued, um, let a lawyer tell you how to do your job as a scientist, right? Uh, you should not. You should not. Be doing that and betraying the public trust. And so having learned that consulting was a little bit unethical, I ran away and joined academia. And I thought, oh, in academia, you know, all those problems of ethics are going to be behind us and people will uphold the scientific ideal. 
and I was soon hired uh, by the EPA to fix a lead problem in Washington, D.C. This is our nation's capital. And because of the unique circumstances there, the water system is run completely by five different government agencies. There's no private industry at all, no profit motive whatsoever. But um, I soon realized that I was asking questions, not getting answers. And I soon realized that the government had known that lead in water was high. Water was high in the White House. Leaded water poisoned uh, the vice president. Maybe it caused Graves' disease in um, a dog and you know the Bush family. This is 2004. And water was high throughout the entire city. And uh, no one knew about it. Uh, except the agencies. They were lying to the public. And so that was incredibly stressful for me because I had always admired the EPA and its mission and, you know, these agencies, but they were betraying the public trust just like we had in consulting. And so to make a long story short, I was soon fired by the agencies. And rather than crawl away and be quiet, uh, I spent seven years and over a million dollars of my money to expose what they had done. And it was horrible. Yeah. Mark, and, uh, we, we don't see the slide, we see a blue. Yeah, there's nothing there. Oh, it's just, okay. uh, yeah. Go on, sorry. <laughs> so ultimately, you know, for me, unlike many whistleblowers, I was vindicated uh, in the Washington Post and uh, there was a congressional hearing that showed the Centers for Disease Control had written falsified fabricated reports to cover up uh, what they did. And you'd think I feel good about it, but I didn't. I felt a sense of hopelessness because what I realized that these government agencies were corrupt, they were loyal to their institutional interests over the truth. They learned nothing from what happened in Washington, DC, except they could abuse power and get away with it. And these are government science agencies, right? And so this was really sickening for me to realize. And I had to go back to my 10 commandments and come up with some new ones. Um, and what I'd learned in DC was some untrained scientists are better scientists than those with titles like PhD. Uh, I'd work with normal citizens who cared about seeking and speaking the truth. Feynman never talked about don't lie or cheat as a scientist. I guess it was self-evident in the fifties, but it's not now. And the other thing, the famous, Comedian George Carlin noted bullshit is rampant, parrots are full of it, teachers are full of it, clergymen are full of it. But I learned too many scientists, engineers are full of it too. And we have a responsibility, I think, as scientists and engineers to call out liars and cheaters when we see them. Now, if you know anything about human nature, the, the problem with that is we're very tribal. And if you do the right thing, and you expose uh, misconduct by colleagues uh, and institutions, you're going to be punished. You're, you're going to be shamed uh, and shunned. And this is very, very painful. Very few people can withstand that kind of uh, abuse. If you read about ostracism, the power of the power of silence in many primitive societies, and I think we live in one today, uh, ostracism is, is considered worse than death. So this is this is very, very powerful. And so, you know, reflecting on my career, exposing scientific misconduct, politicized science, it's important, but it's like walking a tightrope because you have to build your career. As a scientist, you got to get money. Without it, you your professional life is over. You have to conform. You need friends. Uh, to do that, you got to tell people what to hear and you got to align yourself with the powerful, but you know, if you want to do the right thing, you're going to be destroying your career and making people mad at you uh, by speaking the truth when they don't want to hear it. And so I'm the first to say that I'm I'm a coward. I'm a trained coward uh, in this climate. I, I figure I'm a coward 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, and you need to do that because with just Having 0.1% of your life not being a complete coward and doing the right thing, um, you can sort of barely keep your job and career. Uh, if you shifted these numbers any at all, you would soon have no friends, no career, no job. I guarantee you. 
Okay. So, you know, that's, that's sort of a problem. Like we are, we are trained cowards. Shouldn't be that way. Uh, but that's the institutional world we live in. And so, um, yeah, uh, I tried to speak out against uh, misconduct. I tried to prevent another Washington, D.C., but I was unsuccessful. And soon the same thing was happening in Flint. Uh, thankfully, I was able to help expose that in a very short time period, and it became a national and international media sensation the malfeasance, again, of government science agencies. Um, and a lot of things happened that almost never happened. Again, we were kind of vindicated. Uh, we were asked to work and help the agencies that we were fighting just, you know, years before. And I was proud to work alongside them. And, you know, they did, did a good job. But again, you know, I was... Uh, vindicated publicly but within our institutions and my profession i was demonized uh, because i was a whistleblower and people attacked me and um, destroyed my career and i wish it were otherwise um and so you know i did get external awards and those were very very helpful uh, for me to continue going on um, not only did it give me some you know, peace of mind that I'd done the right thing to assuage the harm from my friends and colleagues. But, you know, I did get the disobedience award and I told them, if you ever want to experience hell on earth, expose wrongdoing by your friends or your profession or institutions and be proven right. And you will live hell on earth. So help me, because that's who we are uh, as as people. And so you know, it, we got a lot of press attention um, for exposing the politicized science, for exposing scientific misconduct. And I kind of reflected on that and uh, told the Washington Post, you know, we, we do live in a post-truth world now. You know, we're, we're far away from the wisdom we had after World War II and those, those first seven commandments of Feynman. And in a post-truth world, science is often just another weapon of tribal warfare. And if you want to rise above that, uh, it's going to take courage. And so, uh, or as another person said, you know, I started reflecting on this climate and uh, Charlie Munger works Ber Berkshire Hathaway said, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome, right? And so we do live in a, in a climate of perverse incentives in science, in America and in academia. Uh, we've got hyper competition now for grant money, not only amongst professors, but amongst agencies. Uh, we've got a perverse incentive reward structure that emphasizes quantity over quality and all these quantitative metrics that are people that we're measuring people by and that can be cheated. And uh, we also have a rise of team science where it's almost impossible to have a career as an individual researcher anymore. So for all its advantages of team science, I think it increases conformity and it's very, very dangerous. And so, yeah, um, we wrote this paper outlining some of these concerns in 2016, uh, worried that if things are not fixed, if we don't change the, pers the perverse incentives, we're going to continue to encourage cheating and conformity and cowardice. And nothing I've seen since 2016 has caused me to regret what I wrote, or in fact, I feel things are just getting worse and worse and worse um, in academia. I'll just highlight a few things uh, very, very quickly here. Um, we, um, we've we got American universities are, are hyper competitive. We have rating systems. Uh, many of our universities cheated and reported false data to the ranking system so they could get higher rankings. So I noted some of those in the paper I wrote but this was just last year, like, you know, Columbia University was ranked number two and uh, they admitted to reporting false data to get a higher ranking, you know? So if our institutions are corrupt and there's no punishment for it, um, there's nothing happened for, for lying and cheating, then, you know, how can we within those institutions uh, be expected to do better ourselves? Um, had a student loan scandal in America that's just horrible. It was sold as a way to save money, to make the world a better place. 
And instead, uh, a lot of universities were guilty of false advertising, charging very poor people outrageous sums of money for degrees that are almost completely worthless. Um, and we got, you know, pretty near a trillion dollars of debt as a result of that scandal. And again, because academic institutions are, are considered not for profit, um, despite this criminal wrongdoing, no one was held accountable, right? Um, in our paper, we had some hope that honesty researchers could help us out and change uh, the incentive structure so that we could encourage ethical behavior, or at least stop discouraging um, whistleblowing. Uh, but we've had huge scandals in honesty research, you know, just as an example in America. So Mark Hauser uh, did a lot of work on ethics at Harvard. Uh, he was found guilty of scientific misconduct. And then just this last year, our two most famous honesty researchers in America, Dana Riley, uh, was found to have written several studies that use fake data. And then another honesty researcher at Harvard, um, Francesco Gino, uh, wrote a whole raft of papers uh, that were also proven to be dishonest with fabricated data. Uh, she's suing Harvard, uh, claiming defamation and sex discrimination. Uh, we'll see how all that turns out. But, you know, I'll just kind of point out her most recent book uh, was Rebel Talent, Why It Pays to Break the Rules at Work and in Life. And uh, that's actually a sad commentary, I think, on, on academia in present day, that it cheating dishonesty, unethical behavior pay. And whistleblowing and doing the right thing and seeking the speaking the truth are punished. And that is the very definition of perverse incentives. If you ever wanted to create a system that would lead to politicized, untrustworthy science, that's the direction that we're heading. Um, it's causing a lot of problems because science and engineering and government institutions are, are losing trust and they're losing trust because too few of their employees are deserving of the public trust. The public trust is being betrayed over and over again by elite institutions. And this most recent poll just from a few months ago has shown how trust in all American institutions is plummeting. Um, it's a kind of a betrayal of the elite, if you will, it's gonna have all kinds of consequences for society going forward. And uh, with that, I think that's all I wanted to say and just sort of as a background and open it up for questions and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, let me start with a few questions before uh, opening up for the, uh, the audience. And I will bring myself to the front with you. Now we are duo on the screen. And so the incentives. And the incentives are in the center of your paper. And one of those in in incentives is too much competition. Too much competition. Uh, so what, what do you suggest less competition and more trust in the scholar, in the academic? Uh, in my say, how would the how would the public know that I am performing and accountable for the money that they are investing in me, in you, in the others, when there is no competition? So, right. Well, I think it comes down to um, first and foremost, how do you treat cheaters to oversimplify? cheaters and liars and bullshitters versus whistleblowers, okay? Now, if you have a system that rewards unethical behavior, where cheaters and liars and bullshitters get ahead and honest people are punished, you are headed in the wrong direction, especially if it's science, okay? You will create a corrupt society. That is absolutely guaranteed. You can look at, for example, uh, a good example I used in the paper was professional cycling, right? And you study the Lance Armstrong story. 
And people look to sport because you think there are rules to be followed and you have guidelines for a fair competition, right? And over a period of years, uh, people in cycling realized that you had to cheat to compete. If you did not dope, you could not win. That was a fact, right? And you had the governing body looking the other way because uh, they wanted more money and Lance Armstrong and stories and uh, denial, denial that cheating was occurring. Uh, people who tried to blow the whistle on this were uniformly punished. Uh, they were sued for defamation and lost, even though they told the truth, right? Um, and eventually when Lance Armstrong was finally exposed, when they looked at uh, the blood of all the top finishers in the Tour of France, I think they gave up after looking at the top 13 because every one of them was, was cheating, right? They were all doping. So no one even was given the award, right? So you can create completely corrupt cultures where, where you have to cheat to compete, okay? But and do, that comes down Mark, to... Mark, may I ask, do we have to cheat in order to get funding? Yes, I feel we do. I feel how, I have to how cheat. Come? How come? I feel that I have to... I cannot live up to the fine money and ideals, which is when you write something, you tell the whole truth. When you write a grant that you have that you should point out what's wrong with your ideas as well as what's right. You know, it starts out simple. It starts out, oh, someone uh, goes a little bit far and gives something a little bit too rosy a picture. And they talk about the good side of their research. And eventually you stop writing the bad side of your research, right? So too in papers, people don't write true, true scientific papers anymore. Because if you bring up bad parts of your research or things that will cause them to be questioned, the editor won't let it get published, right? They don't want to hear about it. They want a simple story. Look at what Dietrich Staple did when he uh, fabricated all his, like, you know, all his uh, papers. He goes, editors want a good story. They don't want to hear uh, true science, right? So when I write a paper and I write a grant, I cannot live, I cannot compete and get my papers published or win a grant by living up to the fine many and ideals of science where you tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And in fact, grant writing in America has become like a used car salesperson type situation where people are salespersons, they oversell. Um, there's a lot of actual cheating going on too. There's a lot of gray area cheating, uh, but I absolutely believe that you according to my view of science, that you cannot cheat, you cannot win grants and write papers without without some level of cheating, yeah, okay? But, but the, the I've even seen outrageous cheating by government agencies. I've seen fabricated reports, you know, I've, I've uncovered three or four completely fabricated government science reports, okay? No one was punished for that. There were no consequences. Um, but but honest people who exposed it got fired, right? So so if if your system, if your organization promotes unethical lying cowards and punishes honest ethical actors, you are doomed. Okay, that's number one, right? And so um, that's a really big problem. Uh, is is competition bad? No, I don't think it is. I think in sports, we all enjoy a good, honest competition where there's a referee and some judge and the rules are enforced, right? I'm all for that. I think it brings out the best in people, but you can have competitions that bring out the worst in people, you know? And that's when the rules are not followed, when cheatings uh, condone, when cheaters don't pay a price, you know? That's the world we live in. Cheaters are getting ahead. OK, so, so, that so is happening in science. Let me take you a little bit uh, to maybe uh, abstract uh, thinking. So when we say I have a, I have a, I'm criticizing, I don't support this kind of competition. Uh, 
I was thinking in the beginning, and uh, Shmueli Urshalmi here uh, raised it uh, in the first uh, comment, is it a criticism of capitalism in academia? Uh, the bringing of uh, conservative, neoconservative, neoliberal ideas into academic research, is it the problem? And you say no. You say something else, is that we need to fix competition, but competition is, should be still there. We shouldn't... Uh, uh, say, uh, close the NSF or the ISF uh, in No, Israel. no, absolutely not. No, you need, uh, you know, humans are competitive. Uh, you know, that was one of the problems of, of Stalin as science, right? They simply said, uh, if we had, you know, scientific socialism, humans would not complete, compete. Uh, one of the things that led to the famine was the crazy idea that there there was no competition among species. You could close plant plants, crazy ideas, right? But, you know, it was in vogue. And uh, so we are competitive uh, by nature. I think a healthy competition is good. Certainly some of the things that we've done in America, it, with hindsight, look just stupid in terms of being perverse incentives. I, I outlined some of those um, in the paper but it all comes down to what you reward and what you punish, you know. So you think we should have a competition on whistleblowing, for example. Uh, a competition on what? I'm sorry, Mr. Whist whist whistleblowers. Uh, let's bring uh, more competition on whistleblowing, reward whistleblowing more, and balance the bad and uh, good incentives. Yeah, that would, what a concept if you rewarded whistleblowers, you know. Yeah. Um, we're starting to do some of that here. If you expose financial misconduct, you can win some percentage of the money, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I'd be happy if you weren't punished, you know. Um, yeah. But that's not human nature. Human nature is is to get very, very angry when people don't agree with you. And if people expose, you know, your wrongdoing or misconduct and you will go out of your way to retaliate. And we have a system set up that the number of ways you can be retaliated against as an academic is just mind boggling with anonymous reviews of grants. And, um, you know, and so that's why people don't speak out. You know, mm -hmm. the thing we're taught is never, ever make an enemy um, mm -hmm. because you you those People will go way out of their way to to make you pay a price, right? Yeah. There is a question here from Alon uh, Engert. Uh, he says, uh, uh, "How do we fix academia? What uh, use instead of age index impact factor? Uh, should we move maybe to lottery system? I think you said no. We should still compete, but uh, change the the way we compete. But what about the age index?" Well, you know, when the H index came out, I, I'm guilty of thinking it was a good idea. You know, it sounded so good, right? Uh, it, it's like, oh, we can remove these subjective measures and have one, um, you know, single number that we could use to better quantify who is good and who is bad, because that's how you distribute rewards, right? You know, but you know, it just changed everything overnight. Like people completely reoriented their whole scientific enterprises in some cases or the type of science they do. One consequence in engineering is people realize you don't get fun, you don't get cited for practical studies. Um, so you, you then write very impractical, high risk, high reward papers that get cited, which is the exact opposite of what engineering should be. So a lot of engineers are becoming really bad scientists, to be honest, to just get citations. That's just one example. Of course, you have all kinds of problems with self-citation and uh, schemes to increase your H index. And uh, there's, there's a famous uh, economist quote that I put in the paper that uh, once, it says, once a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be useful. And what, what that means is once you get something, it could be the greatest idea ever,
but if humans realize that's the target, right, they will figure out ways to cheat, to inflate their numbers or to align themselves with that. And then the measure becomes useless, you know. Uh, so definitely read that concept uh, in the paper. H index sounds like a good idea. It's called Goodhart's Law. Once a measure becomes a target, it is useless. Yeah, I, I got it. Alon, do you want to have a, a follow up? Yeah, please. Yeah. So, so what, what are the alternatives? So we can have a panel uh, judging people, but then again, you want to make everybody your friend. So yeah. how we fix the system? Well, you know, humans are tribal. You, you have to read, this is how we evolved, right? We are hardwired uh, to shun and shame and punish uh, whistleblowers. Right. This is something very, very deep within us. Now, to me, science was always the tribe that had no tribe, that put its loyalty to the truth above all other loyalties, above your loyalty to your friends or to your institutions. Right. Is that not the scientific ideal? Right. So I'm not surprised when other groups are tribal and they punish people who raise criticisms or expose wrongdoing. That is human nature. That's every other tribe to me, except maybe science. That's what I thought, you know, when I got involved. Science was supposed to be the tribe that put your loyalty to the truth above all other loyalties, regardless of what it meant in terms of your friends or institutions um, or and, and and that's that's being lost, you know. So that's a real loss if science becomes just like any other tribe, and we value truth seeking and truth speaking less. Yeah. Do you think the IRB system is making us more ethical? The what system is that? The, the institutional board reviews, uh, uh, etc. This is one of the major ethical system. The, the 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 review boards within institutions uh that oh yeah no in america they're a joke um so we're trying to evolve a system you know i there there are things that are happening i think people realize there's problems and we want to evolve a system of policing so that so that bad people are caught and punished and how do you do that you know we're dealing with community policing in the us right now where you know police are given power right uh, for years and years, we heard about abusing the power. Then you got it on camera. And then people realize, oh, there are corrupt policemen. Uh, so what do you do with it? You know, so too in science, we're we're struggling. Um, we've never had a system. It, all of the systems we've used to educate science have just kind of been made up. Um, they're not followed stringently. Um, but it's a complete joke in America right now, because uh, whenever you make a, an allegation of misconduct, frankly, unless it's certain types, it goes back to the institution and your university investigates you. And so the integrity of the investigation completely depends on the integrity of the institution. If the institution's corrupt, as it often is, they'll look out for their own interest above, uh, you know, and of the interest of science or or truth, and you will not get a, uh, any kind of sense of justice. You know, all systems of justice are imperfect. Some are more imperfect than others, and we have a very imperfect system for policing scientific integrity in America. Uh, it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. For and not to mention, you know, I'll just say what the area I work in is government. What I've exposed is government science agency misconduct. And people thought there, there's no profit motive to lie. Who on earth, you're a scientist, you're at a nonprofit institution. Why would you ever cheat or lie? We don't even have a system of checks and balances for that. Like when the CDC scientists lie or cheat, right? There's no checks and balances short of a congressional hearing where they're embarrassed. And then CDC has a science integrity office and they do nothing. Okay. So 
that's part of the problem is you create a system where there was no incentive to cheat and then you don't have a system of checks and balances to police it because humans will always cheat to some extent right so that my problems are partly due to that uh false that that system that's noble in concept but unless there's still some punishment for cheaters uh it it, it goes bad yeah Thank you for that. I'm going to read uh, a question from Oded. And I have uh, Dionis uh, Zink on, online as well. And I know that Dory wants to ask a question, but I prefer the Dory's question in the end. So let me start with Oded. Um, I, inv I invited Oded to, to raise it, uh, his question uh, directly, but um, no response. So I will, I will read it. What will be uh, and, and, and Oded is probably um, a young researcher and says, thank you, but what about advice for me, a tip uh, on early career researcher is doing a second uh, postdoc soon. How would you navigate the balance between advancing one career and the quest uh, to fix the system and expose cheater and wrongdoers? Uh, this is suicide, suicidal. Uh, yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there was just a paper that came out. Uh, I can send it to you where uh, it was argued that scientists should never blow the whistle on their colleagues because you will be punished. And we cannot make it mandatory for scientists to expose wrongdoing if they're aware of it. Right. And that is my experience as well. You know, that's why I, I laid out the tightrope. You know, it's the tightrope. And I'm the first to admit I'm a coward. I'm a trained coward. OK. Um, if if I was not a coward 99, 99.9% .9 of the time, I guarantee you I would not have a job, right? So have no illusions about that, okay? Uh, it that means is that the... you, you were social most of the time, and this is why you got the job. You were also social. It doesn't mean that you had to cheat 99.9% of the time. Or to no, be but you have to you have to do the yeah. When then if you look at my tightrope, and I'll be happy to send it to people. Like it's 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 conforming. It's working with the institutions. It's working with other people. It's being a good team player, right? Um, it's looking the other way. Is that cheating? You know, when when you're willfully blind, when you're trained to be willfully blind, when you're willing to overlook the shortcomings of other team members that sometimes may become more than shortcomings, right? So, you know, to, that's that's cowardice. I wish, you know, as a scientist, you wouldn't have to do that, that we could be completely honest with each other. But again, we're humans, right? You know, so my advice to a young person is, um, first of all, times are good, okay? Uh, as bad as they are, it can get a lot worse, right? If you were a scientist who spoke out in Stalinist Russia or Germany, you would be shot. I was not shot, okay? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm still I'm still alive. I still have a job. So as bad as things are, it, it's probably, you know, in the whole scheme of things, pretty good. That's number one, because we're human. Um, number two, there's a tremendous opportunity and need for brave truth seekers and truth speakers as ever before. I, I do think we do live in a post-truth world, which means lying and cheating are tolerated, truth seeking, truth speaking are punished. So you look at it and it goes, there's a glass 99% empty or is it, you know, is it an opportunity or is it a curse? So it's an opportunity, but you have to pick your battles, right? Most battles are not worth fighting, okay? you have to think very carefully about the fights you get in and early in your career you don't want to get in fights you know i could never have done what i did in dc had i not been a conformist up until age 40 um and, and you know i got in a lot of stupid fights i'll be honest uh but you know more recently i've been able to pick my battles a little bit smarter so yeah times are good um, there's never been a greater opportunity or need for true seekers or true speakers because we live in an age of moral cowardice. Um, and, and so it's an opportunity, you know, realize that. Um, and I would encourage you to go on 
as an out if you're an altruistic ethical actor if you believe in the in the good of science and you want to see science used to be good if you don't persist and if you're not there to fight believe me there are people who who will rise in the system who who are not ethical altruistic actors right so we are weeding out at every step many many people see i've seen many altruistic ethical scientists go I've seen what the game of science is. I don't want any part of it. I'm I'm leaving. Right? Again, if if that happens, you you end up with completely corrupt science. You yeah. know. So it's so it's what I call a perversion of of so natural selection. What you'd like is a system that weeds out cheaters and unethical behaviors and people who oversell things, right? Instead, we're weeding out at every step and discouraging altruistic ethical actors. So that's so if you want to create a corrupt system, you know, you do one thing. If you want to create an ethical culture, an ideas lab, you know, in the find many idea where people are criticized, where 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 I'm questioned by my colleagues, or where they're questioning my data, uh, where they're questioning everything, right? I should appreciate that. You know, I want to be proven wrong. I want to be proven wrong as soon as possible because I'm dumb. Okay. And so it's just, it's just this sense. whole different mentality. But if you're not persisting as altruistic ethical actors, all is lost in, in science and engineering. We need, you need to persist. You, we need you there to fight so that when the time comes, when you can pick a battle that's important, uh, there's a few people who there can fight and win. Thank you, Mark. Um, I will call uh, uh, Dionys Saint uh, in to raise a question, and I would like to encourage Mira, Mira Scholten from Utrecht, also to join us. So, but you first, Dionys. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for, for quite an interesting talk. I was wondering, like, whistleblowing in that sense is the most like publicly visible form of, I would say, resistance in that in that sense, right? Um, what, what would we say? Are there like any other strategies that can or are applied from within an organization, say the EPA, for example, um, in order to, I wouldn't say like sabotage, but like for the lack of a better word right now, to lack, to sabotage um, false reports or, you know, data that are or like outputs that are like uh, based on, 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 on an incorrect basis or something like that. What would like, would you say, like, have you observed or even engaged in yourself in those strategies of like, resisting from within an organization. Oh yeah, well, let me just say, I, I would not have had an, a, any success at all in exposing the misconduct without people within the agencies helping me quietly behind the scenes, like sending me things anonymously, uh, telling me what happened, right? Now they're, you know, they're not going to go to this extreme where they're going to always put their career on the line, although sometimes they did, like in, in Flint, Miguel del Toro uh, was was within EPA, and he was he we plotted on how to get EPA to do their job before I went public. So there's there's a whole escalation thing you go to. You just don't run to the public the first thing. You have to work and try to make the system work. Uh, and we did that to the extent possible in Flint. We tried to let EPA do their job. We tried to force EPA to do their job. When they would not do that, Miguel went public. Um, and then after he was punished, as you always are, uh, as a whistleblower, he helped me, right? So at every step of the way, there's been ethical resistors of various amounts of courage uh, who are willing to help to some extent, not to the point necessarily where they'd risk their career, although sometimes they did. Without that help, I would have gotten nowhere. Without their encouragement, I would have gotten nowhere. Um, I think it's always that way. Yeah. So you're just trying to desperately cobble together a critical mass of moral courage. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. And at previous times in history, you could not get a critical mass of moral courage together amongst humans to stop things. Right. And, and very bad results happen. So uh, every act of resistance, whether it's public or not, whether it directly risks your your job or not, you know, is is something of an act of courage and uh it's critical to having just systems okay it, it's critical to have a, a trustworthy world it, it's those people 
that, that's all helping. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Mira, do you want? I don't want to force you. Yes or not? No, thank you very much. Um, no, I just was a bit more active in, in the chat room. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Mira Scholte. I'm a chair of Open Science Platform at my university, Utrecht University. So I just wanted to give a quick sort of uh, reaction that, well, first of all, great topic and, and great discussion. And Mark, uh, it's nice and, I mean, very courageous what you've done so far. And I understand that in the US it's a bit, yeah, it's much more difficult at this moment than in Europe. But I, I feel like in the Netherlands, we have done quite some progress in the sense that, um, yeah, as you say, this is the system of recognition and reward system that needs to be changed. Because if we are uh, assessed uh, uh, by the numbers of publications and at the quality, of course, we will going to be produce the numbers even without sort of thinking about it. And I think as one of the greatest papers uh, on in, in the topic of my research of uh, uh, I think uh, Baldwin in 1990, 1991, why rules do not work. And one of his conclusions was that, well, first of all, that people may not know the rules and then they don't know how to apply the rules. So I think perhaps one of the ways how we can, you know, sort of change the system is not necessarily go into, well, whistleblowing and sort of in the conflict with the colleagues, but making them more aware uh, of you know the facts that they've been doing perhaps not necessarily is the, the right way to do because many things that I discuss also with young colleagues they they think that that's normal they just done PhD you know and they think that their PhD has to be published with Cambridge University Press that's the only way that they can go and when I say to them as a their supervisor no you don't have to <laughs> they say no Mira you don't understand you have made your sort of career. <laughs> Um, which is not the true because when I was doing my PhD and I just published it, I never looked at the publisher's name, for instance. I looked at my idea, how I can and, and proceed further. So these are the things I think um, we need kind of to make uh, people more aware of the things that they're used to or think that this is a norm. That's not necessarily the norm. So perhaps not this, you know, whistleblower, of course, in the heavy cases, so to speak. We also had a scandal, as you may know, in 2016 in the Netherlands, in psychology that there was also a big scandal of a professor who was publishing many many articles yeah Dietrich Staple yeah yeah I didn't I, want to yeah. name it but <laughs> yes um so this kind of things happen and probably they may happen in any system but what is in, 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 in necessary yeah. I think, that we ensure the quality the quality checks in the system and and that's right and, and the aspiration is to always <laughs> minimize it you cannot eliminate cheating all right. But you can encourage less cheating. And that would be a noble goal. And whether it's done through open science, uh, we, we need everything. We need reform at every part of the system. We need honest, open conversation about all the ways we can try to fix the system, because I really believe the fate of humankind does depend on it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, I will ask now uh, Sharoni Shapir to, to intervene and then uh, Dov uh, Dor. So Sharoni, please. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Uh, so maybe two related questions about how gauging the, the gray zone. But one has to do with, you, you put a lot of focus on incentives and uh, reward systems, but then you also mentioned that also in places where there's no uh, incentives or reward systems like uh, non-profit organizations and such, you also have that problem. So, so then how strong really is the incentive problem versus human nature? And so that's one question. And the other thing about gray zones is about white lies, kind of. So, uh, right, so, 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 so how is it, how special is it in, in academia or in science versus just socializing, right? So, so, so if we have dinner together, I'll tell you, right, we, Thanks for cooking food. It's excellent. Or it was nice talking to you. Or uh, let's meet again. Or right, I'm just just socializing things. I don't tell you exactly what I think every second of, of how you cook to me or what you look like or what you said. Right. I mean, people that are like that really are, can socialize. It's it's called it's a social disease. <laughs> uh, so also when we're working in in a team, right, I tell you, yeah, this looks great. Yeah, good idea. I mean, some of that. So so where do you put the the balance between what's socializing, white lies? You think. And versus when it's overboard. Yeah, those are two really great um, questions. So the first had to do with uh, institutions where you think, oh, I have a government science agency. There's no profit motive to lie, right? 
there's a very famous law that you can look up. It's called the Iron Law of Bureaucracy. And what it talks about is within any institution, you can oversimplify and say there's two types of people. There's a group of people who is loyal to the mission statement. Again, it's all a lot of ethics is about competing loyalties. What are you loyal to, right? So you can have a noble mission statement. You can have noble rules. And, and there's a group of people who are, that's their highest loyalty, right? And then you have a group of people who always want to become tribal, who always want to put, do something or cut a corner be, or lie because they think it's in the, it will better the institution. Think of the, the Catholic Church, you know, for example, and and all the, the 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 lies that were told because they didn't want to deal with a problem, right? And we're defending the institution. We can't we can't let no known about pedophilia in the Catholic Church because it will be destroyed in the institution, right? No, what what destroyed the institution was you knew about it and you covered it up for decades, right? So that's the classic fight within an organization. Are you loyal to the mission or are you loyal to what you think or you'll convince yourself are, are, are the goals of the institution? And the iron law of bureaucracy says that eventually in every institution, those loyal to the institution are promoted and they will win. And unless, and, and when that happens, unless they win and control is given back to people who are loyal to the mission, uh, you will have a corrupt institution. You'll have an institution that is willing to betray its mission statement, okay? And that's what's happening in America over and over and over again. These institutions, they have wonderful mission statements, they have wonderful rules, but people get in there and they're very, very tribal and those mission statements are just words to them. And the, the, the people who uphold the mission are usually the whistleblowers, right? That's the number one incentive for whistleblowing is people who are very upset the, in, the institution's breaking its own rules, they're betraying their own mission, and they get fired. So again, you you have this fight, and it always it's always happening. Like, you can have a perfectly good institution today, and tomorrow it will slowly become corrupt, because that's what humans do, right? I think so too within groups, you know, um, can you can you create a culture, uh, a circle of deserved trust? The highest aspiration for any civilization or group is to have deserved trust. And what does that mean? You know, it goes back to those ideals. It goes back to, yes, you know, tell me how great I look today and encourage me. Uh, yes, oh, great idea, right? Um, you know, but in the end, you you have to encourage criticism. You have to have a mindset. Prove it, Let's prove ourselves wrong as soon as possible, okay? Um, how are we fooling ourselves, right? Asking the question, hey, how are we the bad guys, right? Um, are, are what we doing, is, is it good? There's a very famous YouTube video you ought to watch. Uh, are we the baddies, okay? Uh, it's the question that no one asks, right, within institution. Because of course, we want to think we're the good guys, right? And the more fancy your name is, like I come from a field of environmental engineering, it sounds very altruistic. You get a lack of moral humility, right? Uh, without moral humility, all is lost, okay? You you always have to be questioning yourself. You have to be questioning your friends. You have to be questioning your institutions. You got to encourage that kind of dialogue. And I think you prevent a lot of really bad behavior. Thank you, Mark, and um, for an excellent uh, answer and talk so far. I have one question, what should we do now after you talk? Uh, but le let's start with Dory. Last question from, or last before mine, question from Dory. Dove Dory, please, please. Um, and I hope uh, Mark was part of this uh, discussion. So Dove, uh, I know basically what you want to say, so please explain and uh, let's uh, see if Mark can, can answer. Hi, hi, Mark. Thank you for this very interesting and uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I want to connect it to the current events that we in Israel are currently experiencing. I'm sure you're aware of what has been happening. And, and specifically, I want to relate, since you talked about the many of the academic, prestigious academic institutions in the US, such as Columbia and Harvard and and others the, in which 
we as Israeli academians were very disappointed from the reaction uh, of the demonstrations and, and the lack of, of uh, what we deem to be improper uh, or lack of dignity in their response. Could you relate to this and does it, how, if anything, it, it relates to the, the lack of honesty of these institutions in general? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's a whole separate talk uh, that I have. It's about, you know, the politicization of these institutions. Uh, you know, we, we've seen horrible politicization of, uh, of academic institutions in this country over the last few decades. Uh, very few conservatives are going into academia. Uh, we have many more professors becoming, uh, you know, very, you know, Marxist professors. Uh, we, we have departments in which 100% of the professors are, are, are not conservatives, okay, in many, many institutions. You get, you get a, whenever you get a lack of political balance, it doesn't matter where, it's very, very dangerous, okay? You get an echo chamber. And the universities of America too frequently have become echo chambers, uh, I'm dealing with uh, that right now. I've been canceled by many social scientists. They follow me around. They protest me. Uh, some of these people are really dangerous, um, in my opinion. They do not want free speech. Uh, they believe in advocacy for the oppressed. Uh, and I've got a whole talk on that and how that backfired in Flint. And... Uh, it, it's very unbalanced. It's very scary uh, to me, uh, but it's a whole separate talk. Okay. Yeah, I, I get you. Thank you. So I, so I see what you see. It worries me. It's been worrying me, yeah, since I wrote the Perverse Incentive paper uh, and witnessed this politicization of science. Yeah, it's... it's you, and, and it was one thing when it was just you know, I guess as a scientist, I'm sad to say this. When it was in the social scientist, I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, now they are getting an engineering and science, too. OK, I can tell you that there's no avoiding these people. They have they have very strident views. And uh, there, there's no longer you, you cannot ignore uh, this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, okay. Dov. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, I see Daniel Levy with, uh, wants to speak. If you have time, a few more minutes, Mark, we'll give Daniel. Sure, yeah. sure. So, Daniel, please. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on what Mark said earlier. But I think, I guess, we would all like to think that as scientists, we somehow are... are in some sense, better than average. And uh, when I was, became a chairman of the department over here, the Department of Economics at Bar Ilan University, so people, my colleagues came to me with all sorts of issues, problems, questions, and suddenly I discovered that they are like everybody else. Some of them are cuckoos, some of them are funny, some of them are smart, some of them are crazy. And I didn't know until I became chairman, I didn't know that. So they, 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 we are like everybody else. We respond to incentives like everybody else. We are humans and we are no different on average. That's my observation. And that's and that's sad, you know, because if you if you were to uphold the aspirations of science, like as embodied in the seven commandments or whatever, or the scientific method, right? Uh, we are better in some ways. We if we uphold truth as the highest loyalty, uh, we more frequently get close to the truth, okay? And it's not because we're perfect, it's because we suck less, all right? Um, and so you don't have to be perfect to aspire to a objectivity. You don't have to be perfect to aspire to uphold the truth. And to speak to that other question, we, we've got this whole group in academia uh, the postmodernists who who have a certain view that science is all a game. It's a power game where you're lying and you're cheating to get power over people. And there is no such thing as objectivity and truth. And when I heard this, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I thought it was a joke. 
But these people really believe this to be true. And so to the extent we uphold the scientific ideal, we can do better. We have done better. The, the proof is irrefutable. It's all around us, right? But if science becomes just like any other ins institution, and, and we, we are no different than other people, then the postmodernists become right. The postmodernists become right because at its worst, if you look at politicized science in, in Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, and in parts of America today, uh, we are not up, living up to the scientific ideal. We are no better than anyone else, and, and no one should trust us, honestly. There are entire areas of science where, where the public is right to distrust us. Last question, Mark. What should we do now? There are many ideas, but you know, we are, you said you are covered. I'm even more, right? What can I do to make the world better? Well, I think, I think it was like Myra said, first off, all of us can contribute in our own way. We have to get improved system. We have to get better incentives, right? that are more aligned with goals of people loyal to the mission of science and not selfish interest in the institution. You know, con we got to deal with conflicts of interest. We got to deal with cheating. There has to be a system of punishment and disincentives for, for cheaters, liars, and bullshitters, you know? And to be honest, th there's not. You, you cheat and lie and bullshit, you get ahead in science now. I'm afraid to say, unless you are a really stupid cheater, we only catch the stupidest cheaters. Okay, that is absolutely true. If you're a smart cheater, you're gonna get away with it, you know? So that's a little bit scary. Um, if you can find and pick your battles, um, yeah, I mean, I think blowing the whistle is sometimes necessary, but it's a last resort and very few people can do that. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very hard. So we need to fight this on all, every step, but the first thing, comes from honest communication and admitting we have a problem and in trying to deal with it. There's too many people who don't want to admit we have a problem because they feel the public will distrust us less. No, I think uh, the public would respect if we admitted problems and punished liars and cheaters. They don't expect us to be perfect. They do expect us to be somewhat better uh, than many other groups when it comes to issues of truth. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Thank you very much, all of you who stayed with us. Uh, I appreciate very much what you have to say. I think we should uh, go on and speak about those issues, uh, raise them, teach ethics as you teach, um, and take uh, the moral vision of science and uh, the humanities more seriously whenever, uh, what, when we wake up in the morning, when we walk and when we teach. Thank you very much all and see you in the next uh, uh, meetings of this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.